Okay, so let's get started. So uh, we want to do, what do we want to do? I guess I want to show you, uh, what shall we do? Well, okay, let's first do, I want to show you that in certain sense, uh, this uh, optimization problems are not much harder than decision problems, right? So in particular, uh, we want to, uh, let's show that if you could uh, solve a decision problem for traveling salesmen. So what is a decision problem for the traveling salesman? It's a problem that says the following. You are given the map and the number K. The question is, is there a route through the cities that is of total length at most K? So it's just yes or no. Traveling salesman optimization problem, on the other hand, is uh, you are given the map, find the optimal route. So it kind of looks strange that just the ability to answer yes or no, uh, if there is a route sh shorter than certain number k, is uh, kind of in almost enough to actually find the route. Okay, to see that, uh, we will first generalize uh, the decision problem by the fall as follows. So you are given a map, right? With all the distances between the cities. And you are also given a, pa a, uh, a partial route, right? And the question is, uh, uh, is there extension of given uh, of given root? How do you spell root? Arrow H and the end. Oh. I don't know why you guys have such a complicated spelling. <laughs> Isn't it easier that the one sound, one symbol? In Serbian, there are 30 letters and 30 sounds that we can make. And even if you don't understand anything, in 15 minutes you can learn how to read, right? But the grammar is a nightmare. <laughs> okay, is the, their extension of the given root so of land of total Length um, at most k. And we assume that all the distances and the bounds are integers. Uh, maybe very large, but integers, right? So clearly, this problem is more general than the traveling salesman decision problem because traveling salesman decision problem is a special case when you are given just uh, zero, when you are given empty uh, partial roads, right? So it's a special case maybe, yeah, the, when uh, uh, your root is, contains uh, uh, zero vertices, uh, okay. Now I claim that this problem, when I, you are given a partial root, is not harder than just the plain one when you are not given partial solution. How would you solve this problem if you knew, if you had a, an oracle that solves, uh, that tells you yes or no without partial root being given? Can you somehow do a surgery on this problem to reduce it uh, to a traveling salesman 
decision problem. Yes. Exactly. So what you can do, first you can remove all the edges that are incident to intermediate vertices. And then you can glue together the ends. Then you find, uh, you answer the question, uh, is there a root of total length uh, k minus the length of this partial root? And the answer is yes. Then, of course, whatever this optimal root is, if you split it open, uh, in, uh, you will go back to the original graph, it will produce optimal solution for this, right? So this problem is actually not harder um, than the original problem. Okay. So now, um, if you have an oracle that tells you um, if there exists a uh, uh, for a given bound, if there exists a root or not of that uh, uh, size, uh, how can you find out the length of this optimal root with few calls to this oracle? How many calls do you need uh, in order to find the answer? How would you do it? Uh, so you have a, an oracle that answers the question, is there a root of size at most k? And you want to consult this oracle to determine what is this minimal size root. How would you do that? One possible thing, one possible way is like make a connection a path to itself. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, you, are, you don't have to produce the path. Okay, if you do it by reducing by small amount, you might end up asking a lot of questions. So what is a fast way uh, to, uh, and assume that you even don't want to kind of, uh, what is the fastest way kind of, and the most simple way to find out the optimal length? Binary search, exactly. You ask, is there a root, I mean, if you are really lazy, is there a root of, of uh, length 1, then is there a root of length 2? Once you hit 2 to the k, right, uh, uh, then you start binary search, always asking, is there a root of length at most that? And so in the log of the length of the optimal root, with log many questions, right, you can nail down exactly. So if we had an oracle for um, traveling salesman decision problem, we can find uh, uh, length of uh, opt solution in uh, a log of uh, this length and many log two of length and many questions by binary search. Good. Now, so how would you now, if you know what the length of optimal solution is, how would you find that optimal solution? What would you do? Ah, so you simply range through all the edges and you ask a question. Is there a root that extends my edge of length at most L minus the length of this edge? And once you hit an edge that is on the optimal root, the answer will be yes. And then you keep extending by searching through 
um, uh, through all of the by keeping by extending the um, the root. So this will take uh, how many steps it will take? It will take probably uh, only the number of edges many steps because uh, the edges that you asked once and got answered no, you can simply ignore them and in the rest of the search you can use only the remaining edges. So in the number of edges that is uh, equal uh, the, in the number of uh, subroutines that is uh, just uh, the equal to the number of vertices, uh, you can ask, you can find optimal solution in, so that would be n squared, that most n squared many runs, and this algorithm was a log n times the whatever is the runtime of the, of the Oracle algorithm for the uh, yes or no traveling cells and problems. So the multiplier is obviously bounded by a polynomial. So if you had an algorithm that runs in certain time uh, that uh, solves the decision problem, then it polynomially many uh, steps you can actually solve uh, for the optimal solution. Okay, so this shows that in fact uh, the number that uh, uh, optimization problems are not harder than, uh, well, than decision problems. Uh, actually, it's wrong to say that uh, optimization problems are not harder as decision problems. <laughs> the sad truth is that decision problems are not much easier than optimization problems, which is uh, the right thing to say. Okay, so let me now, uh, so everything clear about this? So let me now show you a beautiful uh, reduction of, um, that is also due to CARP. So we want to show that uh, Hamiltonian circuit is NP complete. Right? And how do we do that to show that HC is, uh, uh, um, is uh, NP complete? We will show that three sat, uh, sorry, that uh, a vertex cover reduces to Hamiltonian circuit. What is Hamiltonian circuit? You are given a graph, and the question is, is there a tour of all vertices that visits every vertex exactly once that goes along the edges of the graph? And let me remind you, we showed in class that 3 sat is uh, reducible to vertex cover with these triangles, you remember. And before that, we showed that the general SAT is reducible by t uh, to 3 SAT, the satisfiability of formulas with only three disjuncts in every conjunct. Then, of course, by transitivity, you get that uh, SAT is reducible to HC. And so we know we had the direct proof, the uh, Cook's theorem, which we saw last time, that shows that, in fact, uh, uh, SAT is NP-complete. So in particular, Hamiltonian circuit is also complete. So how do we reduce vectors, a vertex cover to Hamiltonian circuit? You remember vertex cover is you are given a graph and the number k. And the question is, is there a cover of, for the vertex with at most k vertices? What's a cover? It's a subset of all vertices so that every edge uh, uh, has at least one of the two vertices belonging to that subset. So how does this 
the reduction work? Well, it works by the force of Karp's ingenuity, I have to say, because it's one of these mind-boggling uh, constructions. So construction is based on the following little graph with only 12 vertices. And the graph looks like this. Okay, it has 12 vertices. And then it looks like this. Let me not mess it up. You have a line, uh, so these are, sorry, nothing here. Uh, these are connected in a chain, and these are connected in a chain, and then these two are connected, if I remember correctly, yep. And these two are connected, and then these two are connected, and these two are connected. So this is the basic building block of the reduction. So what is a reduction? We have to show that every instance of vertex cover can be reduced uh, to an instance of Hamiltonian circuit. So you are given a graph and the number, and you have to come up with another graph uh, such that uh, you have a vertex cover of size k, if and only if uh, this graph has a Hamiltonian circuit. OK. What is the feature of this strange graph? Uh, the feature of this strange graph is uh, that uh, you can build, a, have build uh, that if this graph, okay, uh, that, uh, okay, the only Hamiltonian circuits that can pass through this graph are the following ones. The Hamiltonian one will be uh, simply the graph, the path will go like this, and in the bottom part, so just a linear ordering of vertices uh, that uh, results in a connected. So that's one possibility. And there are only two more possibilities. And they look as follows. Uh, the, the second possibility is uh, you go, let's see, how was it? Uh, you go like this. You, yeah, you go like this, like this, and then you go back like this, and then you go like this, like this, like this like this, like this, and then you go back here, like this, like this. So you enter here, and you exit here, right? And the, other, or the only other possibility is mirror image of that, right? You enter from here, then you go up to here, then you move here, then you go all the way up to here, then you go back here, and you exit here. So in both cases, uh, uh, the either you have uh, two exits. So in this case, your Hamiltonian circuit comes here, exits here, and then does something else, and then comes here, and exits here, right? The only other two options are with a single entry and uh, exit spot, namely you go this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, or mirror image of that, and you can easily check that that's the only way that visits every vertex only once, right? Now, what do you do with this gizmo? You now somehow have to come up with a recipe. Uh, you have to come up with a recipe which does the following. It transforms your graph 
for which uh, you look for vertex cover. Say this is vertex u0, u1, u2, up to uk. And then you have vertices coming from here and here and blah, blah, blah. Right? Somehow you have to transform this graph into another graph, which will be, as you will see, a little bit larger, uh, so that uh, this graph has vertex cover of size k, just in case this graph has a Hamiltonian circuit. And you do the transformation as follows. Each vertex and all of the, for all the incidence edges will be replaced by a chain of these guys. Okay, so here it is. Say so this is the first gizmo, right? And it has input and, so to speak, output points, right? All together, three here, and three here, and three here, right? And then you have uh, edges like this, and edges like that, edges like this, right? Now, this point, so we will call, uh, okay, so this then will go into another exactly the same type gizmo, right? So here you will have exactly the same thing, right? And uh, then here you will have, uh, if the, the bound for vertex cover is k, here you will have k many vertices C1, C2, up to CK, okay? So this chain, the number of gizmos will be equal to the number of vertices that are connected to U0. Say this one, so all of these, so this, will all belong to um, U0, okay? This one will be part of exactly the same chain, but for U2. This one will be part of exactly the same chain for U2. Sorry, U, no, no, U1 here. U2, at the very end, this one will be part of the chain for UK, right? So U2, U1 will, ha will have, uh, kind of will have a chain, will be connected to all of the guys that corresponds to whatever vertices, right? So if you have an edge between U1 and say U, uh, whatever, UP, right? This means that uh, this will be connected to the a uh, uh, chain that corresponds to UP as well, right? So one side, so you can think of these gizmos corresponding to edges. So if, uh, uh, so if this thread uh, goes to the gizmo that corresponds to vertex UP, this means there is an edge between U1 and UP. And now, all of these uh, beginning of the chain and the end of the chain, they are both connected to all of uh, these points. So this will also be connected to C2 and so forth all the way will be also connected to CK. Now the claim is uh, there exists a vertex cover 
of size k, just in case uh, this guy has a Hamiltonian circuit. Uh. Now, if you look at this, uh, this circuit, if you draw the Hamiltonian circuit, if it ends up in, if it passes, if the circuit passes through the gizmo in this way, it means both vertices are selected and colored. If it passes in the way above, then only the top vertex, so if it passes uh, here like this, then only this vertex is colored, but not that one. Right? And now, if you look carefully, how many points will be chosen? Well, say here, if you go through this loop, say, and you go this way, right? Then you go to C2, right? Then from this guy, um, so you will have k, at most k passes, uh, right? And this is what limits the number of vertices chosen. So, um, so the vertices chosen are those that the Hamiltonian path goes through their gizmo. And because this limits, there are no other ways. Every complete loop has to start in one of these and finish in another one, right? And there are at most, there will be at most k many of these, exactly k, in fact. So you will be able, with k many passes, each pass will determine which uh, circuit, uh, which uh, uh, edge, uh, which uh, vertex is taken, right? Uh, and there will be at most k many of them. So this show it's one can now see that uh, the existence of Hamiltonian path. If you have a vertex coloring, right, you choose whatever vertices are colored, and you do Hamiltonian path in such a way that if both vertices are chosen, uh, then from the corresponding gizmos, you will go in parallel lines, right? And if only one vertex is chosen, then you see essentially uh, doing this means you take vertex u, but you reject vectors u2. To, u to. And if you once you reject it, then this uh, vertex is doomed because the only way to make a circle is to go through the entire chain. If the, and if the chain is blocked at least, at most, you know, once, if it's blocked once, that's it. There can be, it, it is not chosen in any of the uh, K loops uh, that, uh, that you do. Yeah. So this is the uh, reduction I wanted to show you. Okay, now, so uh, what have we done in this course and why have we done in this course, in the extended part? So ex on the top of uh, the standard algorithm techniques, you got a kind of a flavor of randomized techniques, and then you got a little bit deeper knowledge of reductions, you got the Cook's theorem, and uh, you will have a final, but on the final, final is two hours for everyone. So if I gave you an extended problem, I would be disadvantaging you from, in comparison to people who do not take extended class. So what is the conclusion? The, the conclusion is there won't be extended material on the final. But, 
But, but, if you want to be a computer scientist uh, and you don't have a clue about randomized algorithms and you don't know what Cook's theorem is and you don't know basic reductions, you are no good computer scientist. <laughs> you are Donald Trump computer scientist. <laughs> okay. And the point is this, you are sufficiently mature that you have to understand you are taking care of your own future and your own education. So it's stupid, uh, that I, I don't have to examine you on whatever is being taught. This doesn't mean that this was waste of time, as students tell me, because it's useful knowledge for you and the purpose of you taking this class, if you have any sanity left, is to learn algorithms rather than to pass the class, right? So don't, uh, I'm sure you are not be in terrible sorrow that won't be uh, um, extended material in this, but uh, um, uh, this, yeah, so, uh, Okay, prepare for the final, but then at least after final, look again at randomized algorithms because, and the basic NP completeness because at the end of the day when you get out there, I, I can bet my life you will encounter them. I mean, nowadays all this business with big data and you know the dimensionality reduction is done by projecting data on a smaller dimensional space and doing approximate search there, right? So uh, uh, randomized algorithms, you have to use the randomization when you know the things become unmanageable. But uh, the large numbers have this incredibly beautiful property that they tend to um, naturally become ramified. If you have a vector, in a dimension of, uh, say, a thousand, uh, a vector of unit length, uh, and then you use a random number generator to generate the coordinates uh, uh, that, uh, of, a, of another random vector, and you normalize it, say, to be to equal to one, what do you think is the scalar product of these two vectors? Hmm? If you have a very, very uh, multi-dimensional space with zero. How likely it is that the numbers are correlated? If one was positive, the other is likely to be negative. If one was large, the other is likely to be small. On average, some of their products of the coordinates will be close to zero, which means that in, large, in the space of large dimensionality, Almost any two vectors are almost surely orthogonal, right? And so projecting your data on three randomly chosen vectors is like projecting your data in an orthogonal coordinate system. So uh, the power of uh, randomization is just, or you have, you know, you, uh, why do we assume, uh, if there are electrical engineers here, we often assume that our uh, noise is Gaussian. Why is this so? Why is this? I mean, the probability distribution is just this beautiful Gaussian shape, and you know nothing about the nature of noise. Why is it uh, not ridiculous to assume that uh, it has such probability distribution? Why would it be Gaussian? Yes. Why would it eventually get? Well, the thing is that noise comes from gazillions of factors. And no matter what kind of distribution these variables have, their sum converges to Gaussian distribution. This is called the central limit theorem. And it's mind-boggling, right? And it justifies why our models are tuned to Gaussian noise, because simply things come from many, many sources, right? And each source, when you sum up average, boom, it, you end up with a Gaussian distribution. 
Anyhow, so this is the power of the uh, randomized algorithm and Gaussians. So uh, I suggest the following. Uh, next week, instead of class, let's have beer. So study hard for the regular part, uh, and good luck on the final. I'll see you next week. Huh? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I almost ran away with the... Uh... <laughs> yeah.